Welcome to this edition of Rattling the Bars. I'm Mansa Musa. Today, we'll be talking to two extraordinary individuals. Uh, back in 1980, in the Maryland Penitentiary, a program was created that had earthquake proportion in terms of the impact it would have on the Maryland prison system throughout the state of Maryland. The program was called To Say Your Own Words, and the the person that was behind it and responsible for organizing and creating it was Marshall Eddie Conway. And uh, as we well know, Marshall Eddie Conway just transitioning uh, last month. So today we have Celine Kareem Alamine and Bruce Franklin. Both of these individuals were involved in the program. Kareem Salim Alamine <laughs> was incarcerated at that time in the Maryland Penitentiary. And Bruce was one of the participants that came in. Welcome to Rattling the Bars. Bruce, we'll start with you. Uh, tell our audience a little bit about yourself, what you're doing now. If, and, uh... Well, <laughs> at 89, I'm retired, but uh, I'm still active. So right now, I'm a little scared of what's happening in it. In America, the president, the president is being used now to disenfranchise as many black people as possible. That's what's happening. And state after state, Florida, 64% of the Florida voted to allow felons to vote, but the, the state legislature always tells that. So it's, um, the state after say that right now that using using the prison to disenfranchise black voters. Right. It's just that this is new. I mean it, 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 right after post William Section they changed from slavery to prison. Right, <laughs> you know, right. So we, we, that's that's what we had heard, but now they they were uh, turned up that. Uh, yeah, um, and we are, we gonna flush that out. We'll flush that out in a minute. Uh, like I said, to right now, uh, we want to talk about the, the to say your own words and the impact it had on the Maryland prison system, but more importantly the outcome and some of the things that we see that's taking place now as you as you spoke, Bruce. Uh Celine, you was you was a part of this process. Uh tell us tell us a little bit about uh when prior to becoming a part of the Say Your Own Words, how long had you been in the Maryland Penitentiary? Uh I guess about hmm. I went to Maryland Penitentiary uh early, I guess around February nineteen seventy one. Right. Uh, Say Your Own Words came in the latter part of 70s. Right. They, I think it was like 1980. Uh, the first part of the year, around 79 or 80, because right. I remember we was trying to train, see where we would host it at and what and whatnot. But anyway, I guess it had been there about eight years. Okay. And, before and, the uh, program what? actually came into the Maryland Federal Yes. Right. And, and and talk about talk about the conditions. Because both of us was, oh. in full disclosure, both of us was in the Maryland Penitentiary during that period, right? But talk about right. the conditions that was that existed in the Maryland Penitentiary prior again, to... Again, like I said, yes. Again, I, I went in there, I was, I was 18 years old, and mm. it was horrendous conditions. I think they was calling it the bird cage at that time, and right. it, was a, it was a really uh, travesty, really, because it was human lives just being wasted. Mm -hmm. I think everybody's attention was focused on survival, so... It was a matter of the fittest, you know, yeah. the strong would dominate over the younger or the weaker. Right. But I remember a phase that always stayed with me when I went in that Maryland Penitentiary. And the guy said, take your feelings and put them in this bag and then take that bag and put it in the trash can. <laughs> yeah. Because it has no place in here. And I always hold that to heart. I use it today when I mentor programs to let them know how serious things are and what happens in them type of conditions. But it was a horrendous situation. And man, I, I really didn't see if, uh, I was I was surviving at first, you know, because it was just that crazy. It was like uh, when I went in there, it was like fifteen hundred prisoners in there. Yeah, it was overcrowded. Yeah, and and, and, and yeah, 
And they just started, matter of fact, they had just started locking up young. They just started locking us up at young. They were just bringing the, matter of fact, that prison population. When we came in there, because I came in there in 73, when we came in there, the prison population was just starting to turn over with people our age, 18, 19 years old. Uh, and like you said, we survived with the fittest. In terms of uh, the program activities that existed during that period from 71 when you came in to 80, by the time to say your own words came in, what did what was the what was in existence during that time? Uh, left Bank Jazz. They had a number of groups, right? But they wasn't geared to uh, wasn't well, none of them geared to freedom or right. education. Right. They were mostly like sports type oriented. You know, join a baseball club or get in a music band and listen to some music. But you have to remember back in this day, they didn't have computers and they didn't have cameras and they didn't have the things that they have today in prisons. So we was just like uh, isolated on a long tier with 48 cells <laughs> and stacked three, yeah. four, five tiers high in the air and whatever happened, happens. That's right. And, uh, and at that, you know. Go ahead. And at that time, I just, it was just so crazy because they used to call the people who secured us, they used to call them guards back then right. or hacks. Right. And the only thing they was known to have was a real big key that opened the holes in the door. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't have near a key, then you was on your own. Because as yeah. I said, there was no cameras. You was just isolated. So the programs wasn't geared to, uh, I think, occupy your time or nothing. You know, they wanted you to know you was doing time, serious time at that. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, I went into prison. I had a life sentence. It looked like I started talking to a few guys, and it looked like my time wasn't that much. After I started hearing guys, and he got double life, and some had life in 100 years. And I didn't know it could get that ridiculous, you know. But uh, the survival was, just, that was the theme when I went into penitentiary. And you know what? I you know what was remarkable for me. The resonate your point was that not only the amount of time they had or we had, but the people that you was talking to, how long they had been there prior to you coming there. That's what really had me like made the head stand on my head was you talking to an individual and you saying like, "Well, how much time you got?" He said, "Well, I got double life," and then he'll say something like, "And I've been here since 1962." My jail number is, I got three digit or four digit jail number. Back then, we when we came in, we had the, the population that expanded so much that it turned to a uh, six digit jail number. Six digits, yes, correct. Yeah. And, hey, hey, Bruce, can you hear me, Bruce? Yeah. And 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 as you heard, our man Kareem was talking about, talk about what you think, what you see now in terms of the prison industrial complex and mass incarceration. What's your views now on Cause you was a part of the to say your own words, but as you said that earlier, right now as, as it stands now, we seeing a concerted effort on the part of the establishment to really revert back to the environment that me and Kareem were just talking about, where they just warehousing you. That's where we was at, wasn't it, Kareem? Well, the mass incarceration really began in '74, so we're talking about over over almost half a century of mass incarceration. They knew what they were doing. This is the end of the Vietnam War. So they were, they were using the prison to get control of the population that they were most afraid of. Mm -hmm. And so it's been going on ever since. Now we we are we're seeing that state after state is getting laws passed requiring the the way people are recommended to reduce the back the backflow. This is no. This is new. It's, 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 it's just on a higher plane. They, they do exactly what they're doing. So, so yeah, it's, it's not by chance. Right. They 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 want to get complete control of the whole society, and they're, they're not far from doing that. So yeah, you saying that. So basically, yeah, and and uh, going back to uh, to say your own words, because that was basically the idea behind to say your own words to create 
a, a university type mentality amongst the men that was incarcerated. And Kareem, talk about with uh the education level. Cause I remember back then the literacy rate of the Maryland Penitentiary, if if I'm not mistaken, uh was like somewhere between eighty percent. They uh the population could even couldn't even read or read at a fifth grade level. And I, if I recall back then, we didn't have a library back in the 70s. We didn't have no library. The school system was in shambles. And, and behind all that was they had just had a ride in 1971 or 72. Mm -hmm. Talk 72. about 72. Talk about the, uh, the education and how, from that perspective, from your perspective, how people you know, communicated back then in terms of uh, the form of communication that they, they offered. Well, you, you hit it on the head. Uh, education was definitely lacking in that at best they had uh, what they called a school building, but it was very small and it had cubicles where you could go up there and, I guess, read books, but they were sectioned off called cubicles. But there was no access to a real library where you can get access and it's and broaden your mind or learn new things. Every now and then you'll get a guy who have a stack of magazines and you can put your name on the list and view some of the magazines that have been donated, I guess, uh, National Geographic, Life magazines. And if he was fortunate every now and then, you might get to see a jet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, education, it was a standstill. I think the prison then was geared more to like sports. Guys spent their time a lot of sports playing sports or even they was lifting weights. Mm -hmm. Hence, we got this uh, institution with a whole lot of thick guys thinking that that's what it takes to make it in there. So right. uh, academics was definitely uh, not an issue, not a subject matter to be considered. You know, So most guys involved themselves in uh, uh, sports or, as I said, lifting weights or uh, with the limited programs they had, the little music thing, you go listen to music with left bank jazz or uh, what they call it, the bird nest. That's a baseball right, club, right, right. And, you yep, know, other yep. than that. And sometimes you have to wait on the list to get in them groups. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about the early 70s, but uh, it, was, it was horrendous conditions then. I know that for sure. Uh, and you know what? And then we have uh, Eddie Conway and uh, who come along and uh, in terms of seeing that prison population had the vision uh, once Brenda Vogel came in there who created, brought the library system in and created a structure. But he had a vision to to use literature as a form of getting men in the Maryland Penitentiary to control their prison environment and ultimately change their thinking about themselves and their relationship to society. Uh, Kareem, you participated in To Say Your Own Words, and I was looking at the footage, right? And I'm looking at the footage, and I'm looking at some of the guys that's in the auditorium. And like you say, mo uh, a lot of them was like sp in sports figures. A lot of them did a lot of sports. Uh, a lot of them was into the, their religion. But for the most part, uh, they was just uh, good stand-up individuals. They was like men in, 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 in the sense of the word. And Eddie had got these guys in this spot. But all of them had a different, they had, everybody had a different opinion about basically everything. So in terms of like being argumentative, that was like going to come no matter what, because everybody had a different opinion. How was Eddie able to get y'all to come together and read books and then come back and talk about them later on, Stolene? Yes. Uh, I mean, as an intro, in walks Eddie with a suggestion that a program was designed to allow you to express yourself. Uh, without the violence side, you know, and expose you to some books. And these are some of the things guys was interested in anyway. They just was idle because they didn't offer it at first. That's right. There was always a beef in prison. They keep beefs going because people are frustrated. People are being mistreated. People are angry. So if I'm not with you, you're not with me. And, you know, there's always a beef. That's right. But when he mentioned the program, uh, you know, to speak up, uh, to say your own words, that was like a, a new old door opening. It's like, man, a chance to express ourselves. That's At least right. for me, it was. Right, that's right. The people I was associated with. I got a chance to express myself because everybody in prison had a concern. Mm -hmm. 
not to mention that all 1,500 of them was innocent. Right, 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 right. That's right. We just ain't had nobody to listen to us. That's, that's all. That's right, that's right. So when he had an opportunity to uh, join with other people of, uh, like you said, a variety of minds, and it was like a think tank coming about. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't no uh, pressure. It was like opportunity, really, to say your own words. I'm going to say it the way I need to express it, what I'm feeling, what I'm experiencing. And it was like an outlet for me. So I enjoyed the program. I mean, it was, it helped me with some of my decisions. I know that. Right. You know, because to engage with other people, I remember one of the guys in particular was Engelman. I don't know if you remember him. I remember Abraham. him. I remember him. Oh, uh, man. He would come in with a couple extra guests and we'd get a chance to share with other people who was all over the world. That's right. And they was interested in knowing what we was going through in prison, what we was experiencing in prison. And that, in a sense, made me feel more humane that somebody cared about me. And so once I started networking and, and talking to other people and other groups got involved and even guys who consider themselves tough guys, they would start coming up to the program when they found out you could get books. Right, right. Man, we right. got a chance to come in and order books and exchange books and for you know it, it changed the whole camaraderie. You know, it's yeah. like I'm speaking to guys I normally wouldn't even speak to just because we shared in the same subject matter when we went up to say your own words. So yeah. it, was, it was it was it was really a game changer for me, yeah. as well as the other guys. Because when we came down, we would even have further discussions on what we discuss yeah. up yeah. at the program. Yeah. So it was an ongoing event, and you know, you just it just opened up a whole another door. When people listen, and you feel like you are a part of something, it gave you a chance for change. You know, yeah, I think I, it kind of like kept us in touch with our humanity, really. That and that was the goal behind, because he mm -hmm. Eddie said that. Uh, and in, in, in the lit and when when our audience uh review the uh the documentary, they'll see what Eddie said, talked about create a university type environment, therefore changing the thinking of people. Hey Bruce, talk about how you came how you came to be a part of this process. Cause early you I think you was the first one up in terms of uh providing a lecture and your book was I think your book was one of the first books that everybody was uh, exposed. Talk about that if you remember. Yeah, well now, um, there's a lot of political literature. Many people from the, in prison, after prison, talking about the, well, the prison is, and it's, it's a huge interest. Um, I guess uh, it goes back to Malcolm uh, in the 60s, but now it's, it's a, a real agency. So people can find out a lot a lot what is actually happening in prison from people who are in prison or has really gotten out of prison. So it's, it's, it's a very positive force. I taught in prison. And what I found is that the, the level of discussion in prison was much higher than the cases I was teaching in college. Uh, that's right. So, so pe people uh, were very, very serious about about reading what you, know, what you could get from books and they, um, people Social for the, the knowledge. It was a, a very impressive force. Right. So I, I think I think that's going on uh, today. Yeah. But, um, it's um, the forces against it, trying to limit it. Yeah. Right. And and as you said, and that and that's a reality because. Even now, you got so many restrictions on getting books in prison. You got you got to go little. You got to jump through a fiery hoop to get a book, and then they got they got banned the books. They got a list of books that's been banned primarily yeah. because they saying it don't have nothing to do with nothing other than the fact that I want to read something and educate myself. Oh no, this book right here, uh, Forty Eight Laws of Power. This book right here is a game book. Uh, Prison Letters of George Jackson. This book right here is a game book. Uh, Message to the Black Man. This book right here is a game book. They, they put the game tag on literature. It's almost as if, like, remember when uh, Hitler, had banned, Hitler had banned all the books and started burning books. But, <laughs> but Kareem, 
Talk about, uh, and take yourself off mute, talk about uh, how your evolution, because uh, I be telling people about this all the time. They, don't, they, they think I'm telling the story when I say it. I told them that you and I think it was four or five other lifers went out on a speaking engagement and and uh, was stayed, I think, like two or three nights and uh, had the opportunity to interact with the co organization, but more importantly, as a result of y'all education and y'all ability to articulate what y'all were going to get done, the administration proved to talk about that. Talk about the, how the impact of being involved with the Say Your Own Words allowed you to to find, to actualize, like you say, people listening to mm -hmm. you, now you feel like you got worth. When you feel like you got worth, you want to start exercising yourself in that capacity. Talk about that, Slim. Good, yeah, I was, I guess in the South, I, guess I have to say I was fortunate in that sense that once I became a part of the Say Your Own Words program and we started networking, we was meeting other people, and it was some serious, strong dialogue that was taking place. Man, I was very intrigued, you know? And after meeting people, we, I guess, kind of like got invited to a couple speaking engagements. And so they had to go through procedures of getting the commission to approve it, and the warden was on board with it because he knew the caliber and the character of guys he was dealing with. Right. And he could see what the change it had done to us by interacting with other people, and he was willing to take that chance. And so we were permitted to go out on special leads with an escort, of course. Mm -hmm. And the purpose was to share with the people in the community, whether it be a college or a school or a church, a youth program, uh, what was taking place and the effects of prison. And it wasn't just the youth, but their families as well. So we got a chance to go out and speak to different agencies and programs, and that was really good. Then it came apart when they was getting ready to celebrate the kind of work that we was doing. And you mentioned a group called Coach Corral. That was actually a club, fan club behind a, a Baltimore coach at that time. Mm -hmm. And they was having a convention. And in light of the work that we have been doing, coming through to Say Your Own Words and a couple of self-help groups, the warden, with the help of the commissioner, sponsored the group. And he allowed me and three other companions to go to Ocean City to participate in the convention. And so we was actually housed there for three to four days, as you said. And we got a chance to attend the convention, uh, expose them to what we was going through in prison. As a matter of fact, the people at the conventions, many of them, were some of our sponsors who had been coming inside the institution mm -hmm. to work with us, you know, to try to get us more rights, uh, uh, to help us express our concerns. And once the literature was circulated and the dialogue took place, we was able to even develop into bigger programs, you know. Right. So, and the other guys, it served as an incentive to the, the majority of the prisoners because yeah, so everybody about. started getting involved, you know. That's right. Everybody said, man, I, I can see that working for me. I can see that uh, these people are genuine. They're listening to you. They they want to see where you at for you sincere. And if you were sincere and you was putting in the work, then you would get the opportunity to go out on a special leave. And, uh, uh, it was just, I was a fortunate situation. You know, I was with a group of guys. And like you said, Eddie had already laid the path of what we wanted to do. We wanted to expose people to a group of people who had uh, some insight. And I'm telling you, education helped me make better decisions. That's, That's right. a given. I couldn't even read, I could barely read and write when I went to prison. Yeah, me and you both. Hey, I, hey Bruce, as, as we wrap up, Bruce, talk about uh, how you, at the end of this process, of, to say your own words, how did you feel in terms of the impact you thought you would have on that? Because as you see, Salim just said that because of y'all participation in the program, it made him a better person, a more educated person, and an outstanding human being uh, as he's doing remarkable work in society as, right, as, as of the day. Talk about, did you think you were going to have that kind of impact on us, Bruce, when you came in to lecture? Yeah. yeah. Well, I learned more than I taught. <laughs> the guys were, were serious about learning knowledge mm -hmm. and sharing ideas. And so it was a very, a very exciting uh, event to come in and see that in prison and see why the people age like this. So um, I wish more, more people could have this experience. Right. All right, there you have it. The real news about 
to say your own words and the impact that it had. But more importantly, it talks about the genius that is Eddie Conway. Because of Eddie Conway and Eddie Conway's vision, we have men like Celine, who is right to this day, is a remarkable individual and doing outstanding work in society. But for to say your own words, there's no tell where me or him would have been at. Because during that period, as he said, a lot of blight, a lot of hardship. And then we had people like Bruce who came in and educated us and shared with us his knowledge that allow us to become self-actualized. Thank you, men, for uh, joining me today. Thank you. <laughs> and as, as we close, we'd like to ask you to continue to support Rattling the Bars and the Real News. We are actually the real news. We're not the alternative news. We are actually the real news. It's only here that you're going to hear something about a man such as Eddie Conway who had a vision to bring a program in in an illiterate environment and educate people. That people became, in all rights, role scholars in their own right. Kareem got a uh, graduated from college. Uh, everybody, the college program came in. And it's because of people like Eddie Conway. And that's why it's, and it's because of Eddie Conway that we're asking that you continue to support Rattling the Bars and the Real News. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching The Real News Network, where we lift up the voices, stories, and struggles that you care about most. And we need your help to keep doing this work. So please, tap your screen now, subscribe, and donate to The Real News Network. Solidarity forever.